So now that we have learned how firms maximize their profits through total revenue and total costs, and we've learned about the cost structure of firms, now we're going to begin a phase where we look at the types of markets in which firms compete with each other. Because in a market system, firms compete for consumers to sell their goods and services. But they don't all compete with each other in the same way. And because there are different types of competition, we refer to this as market structure. And what we are going to see is that there are four different types of market structure in a market system in which firms compete. And every business and every firm out there competes in one of these four different types of market structure. So the last module in this unit introduces us to the four different types of market structures that exist. And so in this module, all we are doing is introducing the basics of each of these types of market structure. And then in the next unit, in the next two units, I should even say, we are going to be looking at all of these four market structures in depth. So in this module, I'll begin by explaining the meaning and dimensions of market structure, and then I'll describe these four principal types of market structure that go by the names perfect competition, monopoly, oligopoly, and monopolistic competition. Uh, this simulation will skip for right now, and we'll go to this slide right here. The way in which a product is supplied really depends upon how the industry is structured. Economists broadly define all industries as having one of four different market structures. These four structures include the following. Perfect competition, monopoly, oligopoly, and monopolistic competition. Now, there are many ways to separate markets into one of these four structures, but two important characteristics stand out. First, how many firms are in the market? And second, do they produce a differentiated product or do they produce a standardized, meaning an identical product? If we lined up the market structures on the basis of the number of firms, we would put perfect competition at one end with many firms and monopoly at the other end with only one firm in the industry. However, if we look at the second question of product differentiation, it gets a little bit more complicated. Under perfect competition, all firms produce a standardized product, meaning they all produce an identical product, such as farmers growing soybeans. All the soybeans are considered to be identical to each other. Under monopolistic competition, products are differentiated meaning producers produce products that are similar to each other when they compete, but they're not identical, such as different types of clothing. Under oligopoly, they may produce either a standardized product, such as oil companies that all produce oil that is pretty much identical to each other, or they may produce a differentiated product, such as soft drinks that are different from each other. And then under monopoly, there is only one producer of a product with no close substitutes. So here we see the four different types of market structures lined up from end to end, from perfect competition on the end that has many firms competing with each other selling an identical product, to monopoly on the other end which has only one firm producing obviously a standardized product that has no other substitutes. And every product that is sold in a market economy can be considered one of the above market structures. For example, the fast food market, car manufacturers, the market for operating systems such as Microsoft, the strawberry market, or the cereal market. Each one of these competes in one of these four different types of market structures. So when we look at this graph here, this shows us the continuum that we looked at before by looking at these two different questions. How many firms are in the industry and what type of product do they produce? And you can see that when we look at how many firms there are, 
Under monopoly, there's only one. Oligopoly, there are a few firms competing with each other. And under perfect competition and monopolistic competition, there are many firms competing with each other. But when we ask, do they produce differentiated products or standardized and identical products, notice that under monopoly, the answer is no, the products aren't differentiated because there's only one producer of the product. So there are no close substitutes. Um, under oligopoly, well, it, the answer to that question is both. So, uh, under some oligopolies, they do produce differentiated products. Under others, they, they don't. And then when it comes to many firms competing with each other, if they produce an identical product, it's called perfect competition. And if they produce a differentiated product, it's called monopolistic competition. So let's look at these different types of market structures on in, in an introductory basis now. Now, one thing we should know about perfect competition, the first one we'll look at, is that real-world examples of perfect competition are very, very rare. We study this market structure because it provides us with a benchmark for studying and evaluating the market structures that do exist. In many ways, though not all, perfect competition produces ideal outcomes that cannot be attained by the many real-world markets. But it's important to understand that this is more of an ideal than a real-world situation. There are very few examples of true perfect competition in the world. Now, in previous modules, we have, we have assumed one of the key characteristics of perfect competition, and that is price-taking behavior for both firms and consumers. Price-taking simply means that no individual firm or no individual consumer can affect the market price of the product being sold or bought. So if you're selling the product, whatever the market determines the price to be, that's the price you have to sell it at. You can't set the price yourself. And if you're a consumer and you go to buy the product, you have to pay the price that the market says the good is being sold for. You don't have enough power to determine the price that you're going to pay on your own. So under perfect competition, firms and consumers are what we call price takers. Now the basic model of supply and demand assumes price taking behavior. The equilibrium price is determined in the market and firms sell as much as they want at that price. So suppose the market price was $5. If you could sell all you want at $5, raising your price to $5.05 would be silly when thousands of other identical sellers are also charging $5. If you lower your price to $4.95 and you can sell all you want at $5, you're losing profit. So that would be silly. Now, how could this situation arise? Well, because there are two important characteristics that are necessary for perfect competition to exist. Now, why can't firms control the price of their product? First of all, there are many of them. So many that each firm's share of the market output is minuscule. Market share for firm Z equals firm Z's output divided by the total combined output for all firms. If this market share is essentially zero or near zero, firm Z could double or triple their output and total output in the market, and thus market price, would still be unaffected. The second reason that firms cannot control the price of their product under perfect competition is because the product of one firm is identical to the product of all other rivals. Firms A through Z produce the exact same thing. Imagine many thousands of soybean farmers in the United States. Each farmer produces a crop of soybeans that is identical to the crop of each of the other farmers. To a customer like General Foods, these soybeans are perfectly substitutable. If Farmer Z tried to raise the price of his soybeans, General Foods would walk away and buy from any number of other identical soybean farmers. So those are two reasons why firms can't control the price of their product under perfect competition. They each have a minuscule share of the market, and each firm is producing a product identical to all of its rivals. One other characteristic also helps to define perfect competition, but is not unique to this structure. Free entry and exit. It is easy for new firms to enter the industry or for firms that are currently in the industry to leave. 
Freedom of entry and exit means that there are no significant obstacles preventing firms from entering or leaving the industry. We will see that this is important because it ensures that the market will adjust quickly to the presence of economic profits or losses. If economic profits exist, new firms will enter the market and drive profits downward to zero. If economic losses are being incurred, existing firms will exit the market and drive losses upward to zero. Here are some more characteristics of perfect competition. Examples would be corn, strawberries, milk, etc. And so when we look at the perfectly competitive market structure, these are the characteristics that define it. There are many, many small firms that are competing, hundreds, maybe thousands that are competing with each other, and they each have a very tiny share of the market to themselves, near zero. They all sell identical products that are perfect substitutes for each other. There are low barriers to entry, meaning there's, it's easy for, the firm, for other firms to enter and compete when there are profits, and it's easy to exit the industry when there are losses and firms want to get out because they're losing money. The seller has no need to advertise because they can't get any more business by advertising, and they can sell all they want at the market price, so they have no need to advertise. So we say under perfect competition, firms are price takers. The market determines the price, not the seller or the buyer, and they have to accept the market price as a given. So under perfect competition, it's important to know the seller has no control over the price. Now, before I said that under certain situations, firms sell a standardized product. It's true under perfect competition. Sometimes it's true under oligopoly. And of course, with a monopoly, there is only one producer of the product. So what is a standardized product? Well, a perfectly competitive industry must produce a standardized product. That, that's one of the definitions of perfect competition, that everyone is selling the exact same identical product. So people have to think these products are the same. But producers will often go to great lengths to convince consumers that they have a distinctive or differentiated product even when they don't, even when they have an identical product. They will try to convince us that their product is different than the competition because if we believe the product is different in some way, we may be willing to pay more than the market price for it, and they can make more profit that way, even if the product is truly identical. So is an industry perfectly competitive if it sells products that are indistinguishable except in their name, but the consumers don't think are standardized? Is that perfect competition, even if the product is identical? Or would it be more like monopolistic competition because as consumers we believe the products are different even though they aren't? And the answer to this question is no. When it comes to defining the nature of competition, the consumer is always right. So if we think they're different, they are different. And if we think they're identical, they are identical. The second type of market structure that's the, on the other end of the spectrum, the other extreme, is what we call a monopoly. Almost everyone has played the game Monopoly, probably. You've probably played it at some time or another. Well, and think about how you win the game. All other players go bankrupt and they forfeit properties, give up cash and other assets to the lone remaining player. In other words, the winner is the only owner of real estate left standing. He or she is the monopolist. So what does it mean to be monopolistic? And how does a monopoly exist? A monopolist is a firm that is the only producer of a good that has no close substitutes. An industry controlled by a monopolist is known as a monopoly. Now, in practice, true monopolies are hard to find in the modern American economic landscape. Because they are the most inefficient type of market structure and they provide most of the benefits to the monopolist and not to society, in the United States most monopolies are illegal. The ones that do exist are called natural monopolies and the government allows them for reasons that we will discuss later, but even when they're allowed they are highly regulated by the government. So we don't have a lot of examples of true monopolies in the American economy. 
In the same way we use perfect competition as a benchmark because the monopoly model predicts outcomes that are damaging to consumers and to economic efficiency. So why do monopolies exist? Why is there only one producer in a market? Something is preventing other firms from entering. The something that is preventing other firms from entering we call barriers to entry. So while there are many barriers to entry under monopoly that prevents other firms from coming in and competing with the monopoly, we can identify a few of the barriers to entry that are most common for monopoly. These are not all the barriers to entry that can exist, but these are the most common barriers to entry that exist. One is ownership or, or control of essential resources. Now, what are essential resources? Land, labor, and capital. Those are the factors of production or resources that are used to make something. And so if a monopolist has most or complete control of a scarce resource or input that is needed to make something, then they can control its production. Obviously, if a product requires a key resource to produce, and if one firm can control that resource, they will control the market for the product. Some examples of this would be Alcoa, the aluminum company of America. At one time, it controlled all of the basic sources of bauxite, which is the ore used in aluminum fabrication. So they were the only producer of aluminum. The International Nickel Company of Canada once controlled about 90% of the world's nickel reserves. De Beers of South Africa controls most of the world's diamond mines. Professional sports leagues like the NFL or Major League Baseball control player contracts, and they control leases on major city sports stadiums. Brush Wellman controls the largest share of the world's known sources of beryllium, a metal used in, among other things, the Space Shuttle and the Hubble Telescope. The second key barrier to entry, or common one under monopoly, is that a monopolist often has economies of scale. Now, in the previous module, we looked at the long-run average total cost curve. And the lowest long-run average total cost, and therefore low unit prices for consumers, depend on the existence of a small number of large firms, or, in the case of monopoly, only one firm. Because a very large firm with a large market share is most efficient, new firms cannot afford to start up and compete in industries with economies of scale, because their cost of production will be higher than the cost of production for the monopolist that has an economy of scale. And therefore, they'll have to charge a higher price, and they won't do business. They'll lose money. This creates what is called a natural monopoly. Natural monopolies have economies of scale that produce a long-run average total cost that is lower than any other competing firm would be able to achieve if it entered the industry and competed with it. And because it has the lowest long-run average total cost than if there was competition, it's good for society in that it creates efficiency because it produces a good or service at its lowest total cost. Public utilities, like water companies, electric companies, gas companies, they are known as natural monopolies because they have economies of scale in the extreme case where one firm is most efficient in satisfying existing demand than if there were multiple firms competing with each other and would do so at a higher cost. The third key barrier to entry is technological superiority. One firm controls the knowledge to make a particular product, so they become a monopolist. Your textbook gives Intel as an example, but it acknowledges that other companies such as AMD have developed comparable technology in the production of microprocessors, so Intel's near monopoly has been eroded. This type of barrier usually doesn't last very long because technology changes so rapidly and other firms learn about the technology and copy it or new technology comes along so they don't control it for a long period of time. The fourth type of barrier to entry is created by the government. Legal barriers to entry into a monopolistic industry exist in the form of patents and copyrights issued by the government. A patent grants the inventor of a product the exclusive right to produce or license a product for 16 to 20 years. This exclusive right can earn profits for future research, which results in more patents and monopoly profits. 
or a government can create a copyright, which gives the creator of a literary, intellectual, or artistic work the sole right to profit from that work, usually for a period equal to the creator's lifetime, plus 70 years. So here are some more examples of monopoly. Excel, which is a gas and electric company locally. De Beers, which I mentioned before. And these are the four major characteristics of a monopoly. There is one large firm and only one firm in the market. They produce a unique product that has no close substitutes or any competition. There are high barriers to entry that prevent other firms from coming in and competing with the firm so they cannot enter the market. And therefore, monopolies are price makers. They get to set the price that they want to sell their product at. The market doesn't determine the price. The monopoly does. It sets its own price. And therefore, it can achieve high levels of profits. Now, a monopoly, as we said, wouldn't last very long if there were not high barriers to keep other firms from entering. And these are ones that we've already talked about, the economies of scale. There's only one electric company because they are the only ones that can make electricity at the lowest cost. So this is what we call a natural monopoly. And when a natural monopoly exists, the government wants it to exist because it produces something at its lowest cost than if there was competition. But, it's, but when there is a natural monopoly that's allowed to exist, like water companies or gas and electric companies, they are highly regulated by the government to limit the damaging effects of monopoly. We talked about superior technology, we've talked about geography or the ownership of raw, an exclusive raw material, and we've talked about government-created barriers. The third type of market structure that exists is called an oligopoly. Now, try to think of an industry that is characterized by just a small number of huge companies. And now think of two firms that try to steal customers from each other, maybe with high-profile advertising campaigns. Here are some examples that maybe you thought of. Coke and Pepsi, General Motors and Ford, Nike and Reebok, Apple and Microsoft, United Airlines and Southwest. These are all oligopolies, and these firms are known as oligopolists. And like a monopolist, these firms have the ability to set the price of their products. In other words, they have some degree of market power. And if a firm has market power, that means it has the ability to a certain degree to set the price that it wants to set for its product. Under perfect competition, firms have no market power, therefore they're price takers. Oligop under monopoly, we saw that a firm can set its price, so it has the most extreme form of market power under monopoly to set its price, and it's a price maker. Oligopolies are price makers as well, because they have a significant degree of market power also. Not as much as a monopoly, but a significant degree. So what are some of the characteristics of oligopolies? Well, first, there are a few large firms that produce almost all of the total output in the industry, usually less than 10, fewer than 10, um, that are producing most of the product. Now, there may be a few other smaller firms that are competing, but if there are a few large producers that control most of the market, then we call it an oligopoly. Now, they are producing a product that could be identical, like oil, or differentiated, like cars. So it could, they, they could be competing with each other in identical products or differentiated products. It could be one or the other. There are also very high barriers to entry, just like they, there were with Monopoly, and many of these high barrier en barriers to entry are similar to the ones that we saw with Monopoly. And then there is strategic behavior and mutual interdependence amongst the firms. Advertising would be an example of strategic behavior used in oligopoly to try to take away market, uh, market share from the competition. When we cover the topic of oligopoly in more depth in future modules, we'll give even more examples about this and how strategic behavior works under oligopoly. 
But the important thing to keep in mind here is that firms have to worry about the decisions of their competitors and use strategy to make decisions about price and quantity of output. And so what one firm does, the behavior of one firm, affects the behavior of another firm. And that's why we say there is mutual interdependence. And as I said, we'll study this more in depth when we look more at monopoly. But they do have control over the price of their product. They are price makers. Now, one of the key indicators of an oligopoly is the level of concentration in the market. Essentially, concentration describes how much of the market share is concentrated in the hands of the few largest firms in the market. Picture a can of frozen orange juice concentrate to think of concentration of market share in the industry. Think of a frozen can of orange juice as a monopoly. It is very dense and concentrated and represents the monopolist who controls 100% of the market. Now, think of diluting that can of orange juice in a swimming pool of water. The orange juice of market share is so thoroughly diluted in the swimming pool, it's impossible to see or taste any orange juice. This is perfect competition. No one firm has a significant share of the market. Now think of gradually diluting the concentrate in a normal juice pitcher. If we add just a little bit of water, the orange juice is thick and syrupy. It's still very concentrated. This might describe the auto industry. If we double the water, the orange juice tastes just about right because it has been more diluted. This might reflect the retail grocery industry. Now, we have a couple of easy statistical measures to try to gauge how much concentration exists in real-world industries. One measure that is used is called the four-firm concentration ratio, or CR4. This is where we add up the market share of the four largest firms in the industry. So, for example, the four largest firms in Industry A have market shares equal to 30%, 20%, 10%, and 5%. So when we add those four numbers together, that equals 65%. So the four largest firms have a combined 65% of the market that they control. Now in Industry B, the four largest firms have a market share equal to 12%, 10%, 8%, and 4%. So in Industry B, the four largest firms have a market share of 34%. If we compared these two industries, we would say that Industry A, with a four-firm concentration ratio of 65%, has much more concentration and is much closer to being an oligopoly than Industry B, where the four largest firms control only 34% of the market. The second type of measure that we can use is called the herfindahl hirschman Index, or HHI. This is the sum of the market shares squared for all firms in the industry. Suppose an industry is perfectly competitive and has hundreds of firms with market shares each at approximately 0% of the market. If we square a bunch of market shares close to 0, we will get an HHI close to 0. What if we have a monopoly? Only one firm has market share of 100%. So the HHI is 10,000 for a monopoly. So real-world industries have HHI that lie between 0, the most competition, and 10,000, the least competition. Here are some examples of the HHI for some oligopolistic industries that have been measured. Uh, the industry PC operating systems. Um, the largest firms are Microsoft and Linux. And there's an HHI of 9,182. Remember, the highest it can be with the least amount of competition is, an, is a monopoly at 10,000. So this tells you that most of the market belongs to these two top firms. The market for wide-body aircraft. The two largest companies here are Boeing and Airbus. The HHI is 5,098. So still, that's a fairly high level of or, you know, little competition there. Diamond mining is more competitive. De Beers, El Rosa, Rio Tinto are the largest firms there um, with an HHI of 2338. It's oligop the, uh, the automobile industry is oligopolistic at 1432, but we have more competition with GM, Ford, Chrysler, Toyota, Honda, Nissan, and VW being the largest firms. Movie distributors are more competitive. 
The largest firms there are Buena Vista, Sony Pictures, 20th Century Fox, Warner Brothers, Universal, Paramount, and Lionsgate. There's much more competition amongst internet service providers with, a constant, with, with an HHI of 750, and SBC, Comcast, AOL, Verizon, Roadrunner, Earthlink, Charter, and Quest being the largest firms. And the retail grocery industry has the most competition with an HHI of only 321, and the largest firms being Walmart, Kroger, Sears, Target, Costco, Walgreens, Ahold, and Albertsons. The fourth type of market structure is monopolistic competition. Somewhere in between par perfect competition oligopoly lies monopolistic competition. Now, what are the characteristics of this firm? Well, first, there are many firms that exist in the market, but not as many as perfect competition. Large numbers, but not as many as perfect competition. You might think of monopolistic competition as measured in dozens of firms, while perfect competition is often measured in hundreds of firms, maybe even thousands. The second characteristic is that the product is differentiated. The competitors in this industry sell products that are similar to each other, like the fast food industry, but they are all different from each other in a number of different ways. Each firm has some market power. Not a lot, but some market power. So they are, to a limited degree, price makers, but not nearly as much as with oligopoly or monopoly. But they're not the price takers that exist under perfect competition. So each firm has some ability to set the price of its product with some market power. And there is free entry and exit in the long run. So when profits are being made, it's easy for firms to start up and you know, drive those profits down to zero. And if there are losses, it's easy for them to exit and drive losses up to zero. There are no barriers to entry and exit. So the local restaurant market that you see pictured here would be a good example of monopolistic competition. And you can probably make a long list of restaurants, each with a slightly different menu, meaning they are differentiated from each other. So here we have the characteristics of monopolistic competition with a few other examples. We mentioned fast food. The furniture industry would be another one. Shoe stores would be another one. We said they have a relatively large number of sellers. They all sell differentiated products made different from each other in some way. They each have some market power, so they have some control over the price that they charge. Low barriers to entry, so it's easy for firms to enter and exit when there are profits or losses. And there is a lot of non-price competition. What do we mean? Non-price competition means they compete in ways other than trying to charge the lowest price of their competitor. There are different types of non-price competition that we will see when we take a greater look at monopolistic competition, but a common type of non-price competition is advertising to try to win over consumers. Here's an activity we'll do in class to help you understand the different types of market structures that we will be looking at. This table here is a good summary of each of the four types of market structure that we will be examining in more depth in the next unit and the key characteristics that define each of these types of market structure that you should know. Here's another activity that we will do in class with questions about market structure. And then this slide is a summary of the key concepts that you should know that we've examined here in Module 57 as an introduction to market structure. And then here's the final key points from this section. And this concludes our look at Module 57, an introduction to market structure. <laughs>